All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to day two of the uh, fifth annual Women Teach Trading and Investing 2024 conference. Uh, we're going to be live uh, for three days, uh, March 5th through 7th, um, with 20 plus sessions of top educators providing their best info and techniques about how they make money every day in today's markets. So this event is brought to you by tradeoutloud.com and timingresearch.com, along with our co-sponsor, madhedgefundtrader.com. And of course, please keep in mind that all uh, presentations are for educational purposes only. Trading is not suitable for all people. And please consult a financial advisor and only trade with money you can afford to lose. Also, all sessions are being recorded individually and will be available on timingresearch.com. Also, if you search for Timing Research on uh, YouTube, Substack, or your favorite podcast app, you can uh, uh, get access to the recordings there as well. So um, first up is uh, Michelle Schneider of MarketGage.com. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. Thank you, David, and welcome, everyone, and happy International Women's Month. Um, Really, I'm going to do something very different. Those of you who know me, uh, I've been in the business for a very, very long time. I uh, know that I usually do uh, a lot of talk about discretionary trading and strategies to help you become a better discretionary trader. And in the last few years, what Market Gauge has been doing has been working on algorithmic models. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about that and how, as a discretionary trader, you can actually take uh, a lot from that, the pearls of the actual quant trading model because essentially what it does is sometimes completely the antithesis of what many discretionary traders like to do, which is catch momentum and lead. And I'm going to show you how outperformers tend to outperform. Um, and also, uh, really stick around because we are offering to you today something we have never offered before, totally for free. And uh, we will talk about that at the very end. So let's get started. So those of you who don't know me, um, although David introduced me as Michelle in the business and in life in general, people call me Mish, which really comes from the fact that I was on the New York Commodities Exchange as a trader for 14 years, actually, and my badge was Mish. So it kind of stuck. Um, and then, of course, the floor being obsolete at this point. Um, we started Market Gauge, uh, where I am now the Market Gauge Chief Strategist. I, we also have an asset management company in which I'm a partner. Um, I did write a book called Plant Your Money Tree. It's been out since 2019. I'm desperately trying to figure out how to write a second one. Um, but it was at least done, uh, had a wonderful award as the top 100 best wealth books of all time. And then last year, um, I, Traders Magazine awarded me the best stock education in 2023, so that was kind of nice. I am all over the media. Um, I do create a daily, uh, which you can get on my website, uh, marketgauge.com. It's Mish's Daily, and I do a lot of discretionary trading there uh, with tips and education and comments about the market. And also my Economic Modern Family, which I created, which uh, we will not have time to go into today, but you can find that on the website as well. So here's just, you know, show you, in case, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be on camera, but, you know, here, obviously you can see no stranger to camera. I've been all over the place from Fox to Bloomberg to CNBC Asia. I do a lot of work with Real Vision and stock charts. Um, and so kind of, you know, wherever I'm needed, that's where I go. Uh, actually, Schwab, you can see right there in the middle, me and Nicole Petalides, I will be on for International Women's Day on Friday with her. So I'm very excited about that. All right, so what I'm going to go through today is um, really want to show you how you can get these huge profits. And even though we're going to talk about the math, I'm not going to go into the formulas, obviously, but the idea of the math, um, it's a really simple ranking system and it gives you a tremendous edge. And if there's one thing that we have learned this year, it is that the hot stocks keep getting hotter and the weak stocks have really 
for the most part gone nowhere. And of course, no matter what you're doing, whether you're following an algorithmic system or you're using momentum trades on your own, or you're bottom picking, whatever you like to do, um, risk management is, uh, is something that's incredibly key and uh, certainly part of our whole strategy. So we're going to by the end, you'll have a good idea on how to find some of the market leaders that we're talking about. So this is a very, I'm going to put my glasses on here. This is a very different type of investment approach, and that's why I was really excited to introduce it to, to a, a, hopefully, I would think, a predominant group of women. Certainly, all of the speakers are women, because I don't think that women necessarily a, are always aware of how great they can be as traders, number one. And number two, also may not necessarily be aware of all of the newest and highest technology, which is exactly why so many people are doing so much better right now. Obviously, we have a bull market. And that's not to be condescending to women. It's just more of an awareness. And as a woman, I can only speak for myself that I always thought I had to do everything myself. We women tend to do that. And this is a way to really get a lot of help in doing that and doing extremely well. And we know that quant and AI is something that's changing the whole landscape and investing has completely changed in 2023. I mean, even as we're going into the second half, not quite yet, but at least the first quarter of the uh, to 2024, we're still worried about stagflation. We're still worrying about rising interest rates. In fact, Jerome Powell is speaking today, the day of uh, that I'm speaking to you. And we know that we have a restrictive Federal Reserve at this point. And of course, there are so kind many headwinds on whether or not he's going to lower the, the rates. And even if that is the best thing for him to do, um, and all of this, of course, has increased the volatility, has given the market a lot of wild swings, and it has enhanced the importance of risk factors. So like, why all of a sudden would I, after all these years, be talking about quants? Because I have found, again, we tend to overdo things. We tend to get analysis paralysis. And this is amazing way that without a lot of time consuming analysis, been able to beat the market this year. And even if you never do anything mechanically in terms of following a quant, understanding the formula for why these leading stocks continue to lead as a discretionary trader is really going to be of benefit. And then once you have that kind of system, whether it's a discretionary system using quants or whether you're using the quants yourself, it's, it becomes a very dispassionate game uh, and you can exploit and get an edge and also diversify among different multiple systems and then really avoid that rabbit hole of overcomplicating your trading decisions. I mean, I'm always cracking up when I see people on X put up these charts that have so many lines you can barely even see what the price is doing. So uh, why quants? Well, first of all, no matter why, you have to have discipline you have to have good stops and you have to have profit targets. If you have those three things in your mind, then you are two thirds of the way there. And essentially, I'm gonna show you uh, with historical data about how these leading trends actually outperform the rest of the market by a long shot. And this is not just in 2023, 2024, but th historically. And then what market gauges proprietary TSI, um, basically it, what it does is it ranks the stocks for you. So you can identify for yourself what are the best trends to own. So basically what we do is we take the top three to seven performers every month. Uh, some stay as we rotate out uh, and some don't. It really depends on how they are continuing to trend and they never buy anything with a negative TSI. So for those of you who like to bottom pick, you really have to have a good strategy because the quants would say no. Um, and essentially we have five different trading strategies and each one has a different uh, edge for the market depending on what's going on. So let's go through a little bit of history of why the outperformers tend to outperform. So since 1929, the Dow began trading at around 30. Now, as we know, we're near 40,000 and 25% of the gains were contributed by the top 
25% end of year performers. So that's huge if you think about it. And these performers will continue to contribute to the Dow's overall gains the next year. So there's follow through from one year to the next. I mean, just take a look at something like NVIDIA and an upset about that. And so basically what we did was we took that research and we found if we dwindle it down from the top 25% to the top 10%, they even did better by multiples. And so essentially what we did was we took this top 10% with our own proprietary ranking system. And we decided that if we, we would do even better if we did it in multiple timeframes in terms of our analysis, and we didn't get fully concentrated just in tech, although you'll see obviously that this year has been a good one for that, but really basically the ability to spread across different asset classes. So now, don't take my opinion, right? So James O'Shaughnessy, who wrote the book, What Works Well on Wall Street and Manages $6.5 billion um, in assets, he said over six month and 12 month periods, winners generally continue to win and losers generally continue to lose. And I'm sure your portfolio might reflect that. Um, price momentum proves to be an especially good way to identify both these stocks, which will go on to perform well and which go on to perform poorly. And I, again, I have to tell you, I'm this, this, this presentation is not only to introduce this to you, but it reinforces to me because I stubbornly resisted this whole philosophy for years and and now, and now I'm such an incredible believer, and not just because of this year, right? Because I've actually been studying the history, and that's why I'm bringing this all to you. So here's another company. This is AQR Capital Management. They're global investment. They manage $175 billion uh, in assets, and they wrote a white paper called The Case for Momentum Investing. It was published in 2009. Uh, and again, they say the evidence shows that assets that have performed well over the last 12 months tend to do better over the next three to 12 months than assets then perform poorly over the same period. And so there you go. I mean, it's not just us saying it. Uh, this is really has a, a lot of history, number one, and a lot of validity, uh, basically from two great sources that have just verified that. So AQR Capital Management, they looked back to 1927. So if you take a look at this chart here, let's make this, this is the zero line. So let's say this is the performance of the overall benchmark. And if we go back in time, the weakest quintile averaged only 5% returns and the weakest stocks always dramatically uh, underperform the market. Whereas you can see that the stronger stocks continue to do well as the market did well. And when we get to the strongest quintile, it averaged return about 18% and always outperformed the market as well. So this is really uh, an amazing type of situation once you start wrapping your head around it. So the edge is really for us that the momentum works even with very little help from a system. So that's kind of what you have to put into your head today. So this is all based on relative strength investing. And so clearly when we have rising liquidity, uh, stock prices rise, there's an economic recovery, uh, but then the bond prices start to fall. And then as we start to see falling liquidity, then you see uh, basically, again, stock prices will fall at this point, but maybe bond prices will fall. We may go into an economic recession and then eventually uh, we go into this cycle here. And so what really makes us go into a rising liquidity or a falling liquidity Clearly monetary policy, government policy, demographic trends, technological innovation and behavioral factors. And so when people have come to some of my former webinars, I've talked a lot about the demographic trends as mega trends. Technical, technological innovation would be obviously a mega trend of AI. Uh, monetary and government policy is one of the reasons why I haven't been fully convinced that we're not going to see another rise of inflation. And of course, behavioral factors are always an issue because as we get into the herd mentality, which we know sometimes can be very, very dangerous, but also very profitable. So in terms of trade management, if you're following a trend, 
That doesn't mean you never take a profit. We actually have very specific profit targets. We have very specific position risk management, and we have very specific portfolio risk management. So in terms of the risk managed trading, what we do when we get into anything, whether it's a discretionary trade or a quant trade based model, we have a stop. And that stop is very often based on not only the market volatility, but also the volatility of the particular instrument. So <clears throat> essentially, if we have something like NVIDIA versus something like a a XHB, which is the home builders ETF, which has also been a very strong leader, the stop will be different, but it will be somewhere between 10 and 20% from the entry price. Uh, in terms of the targets, same thing our targets will be based on volatility as well. So like, for example, um, we will have an initial target and then stop will get moved up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in a minute. I just want to put this up here. So after we get our first target, we immediately move our stop up. Very often it will go to a no loss stop. But in terms of the volatility of the target, this is the same kind of thing. And we often base it on the average true range of the instrument. So like, for example, and I'm just going to look over here for a second because I want to put up CrowdStrike because clearly that's been the big news this morning after a incredible beat on earnings, that thing shot up. So that one has an average true range, which obviously will be extended today, of $16. So if you think about it, if you're going to put a stop at about 10 or 15 percent away or about two ATRs away on something like CrowdStrike at $16 ATR. That means you're going to get in, you might risk about 32 to 35 dollars. But also, if your first target is going to be two to one versus your risk, then you're looking about four ATRs. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking for a $64 move. So it's possible that even with a move like what we're seeing today with CrowdStrike up so much, it didn't even get to that first target yet because that's a huge amount. But that type of volatility is only based on something like that. Then we would have a second target and a third target. If we have something with a much narrower volatility um, and a much narrower average true range, then obviously you can get to targets uh, much quicker and also, obviously, uh, you will not necessarily have to wait so long in terms of the price movement. <clears throat> so then once we have a couple of targets in there, what we do is we will put a trailing stop. I use trailing stops all the time. And again, that is so much based on the volatility of the instrument that I'm in. Uh, I have been from a discretionary standpoint in Coinbase for a very long time now. And at this point, with it trading at around $220, I have a trailing stop. But my trailing stop is not like at 215 because I would be blipped out on these volatile moves. Instead, I have it wide enough now where I'm going to lock in a tremendous amount of profit and I've already taken a lot of targets, but yet I give it enough room for the volatility to happen so I don't get blipped out. And now I find myself with no position worrying about paying up. And then, of course, if new leaders emerge, going back to the quants, then we will rotate out uh, of, of an instrument and go into the new leaders. What we try to do is we try to limit sector over concentration. And there are some people who think that you should only be concentrated in one sector, but we have found that limiting it to one sector is very dangerous because if you get any kind of watershed event that brings the market in much lower, you've now been overexposed into one sector and that could really cost you a lot of money. So in these risk managed trading, by the way, uh, if you got a major downtrend with inverse ETFs, we do have a small potential also to capitalize on the short side if the momentum goes that way. So what we like to look at is that there's always a bull market somewhere, right? So if you're doing this type of relative strength investing, you want to find the strongest relative trend. So let's go back here to 2004. What's so interesting is this shows you the difference between the best and the worst performing sector year by year. And the difference is 68% over the period. That's quite significant. So if we go back here, you can see that the the outperformers outperform way more than the underperformers underperform. The same thing as we went into 2000. 
2005, 2006. This is uh, as we were going into the down move in 2007. And this was a case where the outperformers continued to still outperform versus the underperformers until, of course, we got to the big crash. But even so, even in the big crash, the outperformers, even though they underperformed the market, they still way outperformed the underperformers. And that's exactly, and this, by the way, is against the benchmark of the SPY. So you can see how it outperformed the SPY here. Well outperformed the SPY, all of this. And then, of course, we all came back here in 2009 and so forth and so on. So the point is, is that you stick to that plan of the best performing sectors. And not only are you going to well outperform the market, over years, look at how many years we have here. We stopped in 2020 on this graph, but also well outperform the underperformers and the underperformers will continually do way worse than the SPY. So one of the other things that factor in, and this is great, and I wanted to share this with you, whether you are uh, actually a um, discretionary trader or you're interested in looking more into algorithmic models, is that we do look at market internals as part of the formula. And those of you, again, who follow me know that I often talk about five key ratios um, that I find to be extremely helpful in determining risk on or risk off. And so I'm going to show you that as of yesterday, how that looked. But we will take a look at also, just in terms of the risk on, risk off gauges, this is uh, how they look relative to the SPY. So essentially what you want to do is look at these gauges, and we're going to give you an opportunity to, to get those uh, at the end of the session. I'm going to show you how, again, for free, um, as our gift for women. Um, this here is uh, showing you how if you overlay the market internals on the SPY, how you can avoid the big downturn. So if you take a look here, here's 2008, look how the risk gauges that you can see right here, which shows bullish, neutral, or bearish, flash to neutral here right before we saw the big crash and how they went to green, which was risk on as we were coming out in 2009. And you continue to see that if you go here to COVID, this turned red right near the top in terms of the risk off factors and look how you would have avoided getting killed in that COVID crash if you had stuck with it, just like you would have done very, very well with this little blip here. And then of course, once we got through in 2021, when we went into that big bullish market. So that's how these risk gauges work. So I want to take a moment here to show you my favorite five ratios. I post this on Twitter X a lot. Uh, I have also written dailies about it because I think it's really important to keep an eye on. So here's one right here at the top. I talk a lot about long bonds. The long bonds are the 30 year plus bonds. Um, they, uh, excuse me, the 20 plus year bonds, not the 30. And how they are performing relative to the SPY can really give you a tremendous insight into risk on or risk off. And you want the SPY to outperform. So far, yesterday it looked a little bit dicier when SPY closed down and the TLTs closed up, yesterday being March 5th, but now you can see that it came back a little bit, yet junk bonds, which are really high risk, high yield bonds, also you want to see outperforming the long bonds, obviously, because the long bonds can be a flight to safety where junk bonds are where traders go when the conditions are risk on, that flipped actually to risk off, as did gold, uh, SPY now underperforming gold, which can be a concern, and that's why lots of attention all of a sudden on the gold market. And here, wood versus gold, because this, when wood starts to underperform gold, can become a very recessionary key. So not only is this already put into the quants in terms of how much we will rotate in or go to cash or take profits, but it's also for discretionary trading extremely important to keep track of. And I can't tell you how many times when the market has corrected, I've seen risk factors still on, which has given me the confidence to buy the dip as opposed to buying the strength when I start to see the risk factors go to off. Okay, so let's go into the, the secret mechanism here, which is how we uh, actually select our stocks using this TSI ranking.
So this is our secret edge, right? So basically, um, if you look here at the average annual returns for portfolios grouped by momentum, this goes from 1927 to 2008. Again, what you see is that the 20% of the stocks with the worst momentum um, really basically always underperform, and the ones with the best momentum always continue to outperform. And I'm going to keep saying that over and over because that really is a simple formula for you to remember. And now if we look here, see, we so what we do is we rank stocks on our proprietary indicator of this TSI. And you can see here in this red column, this is the TSI ranking. This is not necessarily up to date. I'm going to show you one's up to date in a moment. But obviously, NVIDIA has been number one, Meta has been number two, Marvel. This is all technology, Tesla. And then, of course, this is also tech, but it's also um, uh, defense. So let's uh, move on. So now, let's take a look at some of our models just to show you. If you stick. In our NASDAQ 100 stocks, basically what we do is we take the top performers of NASDAQ, which is why this model always does well, because we know technology has been a trend for a long, long time. So it's an institutional favorite. It's safe because you uh, obviously are buying the best stocks, and you know already that we have risk parameters. You get the great trends, you get the industry leaders, you get the proven companies, and you can see that since 2008, the SPY has returned 368%, the Qs themselves 904%, but the five best performing stocks that might rotate each month have performed 2,166%. So that and alone should make you a believer. Another one that we follow is large caps. So these are the, 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 the S&P 500, the best gainers in the S&P 500. In this case, we add an additional momentum filter to it. But this is really the gold standard, another institutional favorite. And again, obviously great trends, industry leaders, proven companies. And just to show you, Based on the 60-40 formula that so many institutional traders have used and financial planners, they have done 43% since 2017 now, just in the last seven years, versus the SPY at 119%, and now our large cap leaders at 203%. So over and over and over, <clears throat> finding the winners turns out to be the best formula. One of our newer formulas have been looking at small to mid cap earnings growth. So essentially, it's not just buying small caps, best performers. We've added a filter of those that actually have good earnings and good balance sheets. So we're not going to buy or it's not even going to become a factor in our TSI if it's a small to mid cap stock that doesn't have good earnings. That's just not going to make it into the TSI. So these are the most dynamic companies that are not high, as high capitalized, obviously, as the large growth stocks or the NASDAQ top stocks. And some of these companies are really relatively undiscovered. And you'll see when I show you a chart of those. Um, and they can very well be the new industry leaders with a lot of fast growth. So again, Compared to the IWM since 2017, 43% growth there, 117% growth versus that in the SPY, in the Qs 253, and the small cap all-stars with the earnings uh, filter in it, 713% higher. Now, one of my favorites is sector ETFs. Um, and the reason why I like sector ETFs is because, A, a lot of them uh, may reflect my economic modern family, um, which I had mentioned in the very beginning is something that I created as a very simple way to follow the market through almost a story. Um, and so what the sectors do is it takes out company risk, right, because you have a basket in each of the sectors. And again, the leading sectors, just like the leading stocks in NASDAQ or the leading mid to small cap stocks with earnings filter, will outperform. You can get very diversified, so you can take advantage of things outside of, let's say, just tech. Um, and it gives you also great market insights. So you can talk freely about what is outperforming based on this. Um, and, 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 and you'll be right on. A, a lot of what I talk about when I go on the media is what are the ETFs and the sectors of those ETFs that are outperforming and why. 
Now, the other a newer model that we've had in the last couple of years, believe it or not, has been cryptocurrency. And what's so interesting about cryptocurrency is that, um, well, one, you'll, we will give you an opportunity to get exposure to it, also very risk managed, but it has done phenomenally well. And we only have two positions in it at any given time and only large cap only. So you can see that um, the crypto pulse quant was up 1,678% versus the Bitcoin in 2017. And you could see that we had a downturn here a couple of times as Bitcoin wills. If we look at 2022, the quant model was only down 21% while Bitcoin was down 64%. That's because of our risk factors. And then as we got into last year, you can see that the Bitcoin in this case outperformed, but we caught it and now this year has been even better. So essentially, to kind of start summing up a little bit so you can get the takeaways and we can get into some of the actual uh, tables that I'm showing you of all these models. We call this SMART, right? So it's strategic because we have a certain criteria and how we select things. We're very strict about it. We call it M managed because it's very pinpointed in terms of the targets and the risk management. Assets because we look at the top performers across all asset classes. There's a reallocation because periodic rotation into these new setups. Obviously, we use technology because these are rule-based algos, risk managed, and repeatable because this is something that anyone can learn and something that anybody can use and it repeats over and over. And uh, the newest component that we've been working on is adding, obviously, an AI. It's almost like a quants on steroids. So now let's take a look at how everything is performing. I updated these charts in the last 24 hours. So this is a really interesting glimpse into uh, four of the models and how the rankings are going. And you'll see that if we look at the NASDAQ All-Stars, that we use the top five, right? So look, NVIDIA obviously is still up there, uh, advanced micro devices, and here was Crowd. Um, so you can see this was as of uh, yesterday, it closed at 313. Uh, Crowd is now trading at 343. At one point it was up to 365 today. Meta also been moving a lot. And then, we stop at 25 in terms of the rankings, but for very often from this list, if you keep an eye on them, you can see how we would rotate out if they drop in TSI ranking, but that doesn't mean that they're still not a stock potentially to look at as a discretionary trader if you just like certain stocks to keep your eye on. This is the large cap leaders, and now NVIDIA is part of that, and advanced micro devices as well. But in this case, we added Uber, and of course, Uber has been a tremendous outperformer. And if you just take a look down at some of the others, you can see some names that are talked about a lot. Here's the Nancy Pelosi trade, which isn't doing very well right now, depending on where she bought it, of course. And here's our small cap earnings growth, right? So this is what I was telling you about where we add the overlay with earnings. This is a biotech company, CLSK, Moore, Powell. I mean, some of these companies, as I said, most people haven't necessarily heard of, but look what's also on the list, which is Amber Carmig and Finch, which just, hey, uh, Mish, yes. uh, we're still just seeing the let's find the next big winners screen. Yeah, yeah, that's I'm, I'm all here. See, I'm see. What oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I sorry should. Sorry about that. I I'll use a pen. How about that? This way you, you can see where I'm at, right? Okay, yeah. That's, okay, that's okay. Fine. My apologies if that was unclear, um, David. But anyway, looking here. So actually, we were talking about here, this ANF, which had tremendous uh, earnings, has stayed on the list. And, and yet, um, some of the ones that we were in it that were doing better, we've rotated out once they actually start dropping in TSI, which is why it's so good to keep track of this. Daily performance of the sector, this is the moderate. So what do I mean by moderate? We look at risk appetite in three ways, conservative, moderate, and aggressive. And as we're looking at conservative ones, we won't use any leveraged ETFs. Moderate might use a couple of leveraged ETFs, but not very much of them. And of course, aggressive uses a lot of leveraged ETFs. What do I mean by a leveraged ETF? If you're looking at, um, in this case, semiconductors, uh, USD is a leveraged ETF of semiconductors. It's a two-time leverage. So it's a lot more volatile and a lot faster, but it follows all of the same criteria, everything that we've been talking about. So this is showing you on the moderate, 
how XRT doesn't have a leveraged one, it's just XRT. But what excites me about this is XRT is part of my modern family. IYT, part of my modern family. Obviously, SMH, part of my modern family. And number eight ranking has been IBB, also part of my modern family. So, uh, and also you can start to see now what's starting to move up a little bit is solar energy, uh, gold miners, energy itself, and TLTs, which I wrote an article about uh, recently as well, which may, may or may not be good news for the overall market. So with this whole idea, it's really basically taken away uh, the, the need to do a lot of consuming chart analysis. Um, if you see my charts, and I constantly post them in the daily, they're, they're very clean. They're very, very clean. I have price. I have a few moving averages. I have some of our overlays, which would be calendar ranges, uh, which is another component to this six-month calendar range, which is a talk for another time. I use momentum indicators through real motion, and I use the benchmark of the SPY and how things are, are, are doing. Are they outperforming or underperforming the SPY, which, of course, goes back to big view. Um, and so, you know, to, to sit there and try to predict the market, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to hope your strategy works. You don't have to randomly decide how many shares to buy. We actually have a formula that tells you exactly how much to buy versus the percentage of your portfolio. And it's uh, it's really says goodbye to complicated and, and, and options analysis too, because we have an options component in there as well. So to kind of sum up before we get into the offer here um, and why I'm so excited about it, and then I'm happy to take some questions, is money managers right now are very interested in using quants and algos for an obvious reason. They finally figured out what we have saw has, has been figured out by a, a Q. K, I, now I'm forgetting the symbols of the ones I showed you before that white paper, which is following the momentum works. It's formulaic and it's rules-based. So it's not nothing that is random. Everything has been spelled out, researched, back-tested, et cetera. Non-emotional, if uh, risk management kicks in, we don't override. So if risk management is getting us out, we will get out without any question, even if we like it. If risk management is telling you to stay in and yet we think the market is correcting, then we do not second guess it. Um, we sh I showed you how they've outperformed their benchmarks over the long term. If you blend together different models that produce superior risk return characteristics, these investment strategies exploit an investment edge that's very different. They're highly liquid stocks, so you're not going to get stuck in something that doesn't have any liquidity and you can't get out. Um, funds use these, so you you don't have any issue. Um, oh my God, we're getting stopped out and now the stock is going to dive because it doesn't have enough liquidity. Um, and what's really interesting is they can predict what's about to move and if wrong, obviously the risk management will get you out. But in terms of the prediction, for example, when this got into home builders, uh, our sector ETF, uh, ages ago, I was thinking, wow, all anybody was talking about was a recession and a crash of the real estate market, which of course we know turned out to be wrong. And this is repeatable. Uh, so we always deliver better outcomes for our, all of our clients, whether they're subscribers or in the uh, assets under management as a result of this. So anyway, before I get into the uh, offer, if you want to Jot this down. I'm on X at Market Minute. Uh, MarketGauge.com obviously is our uh, website, and Market Beat is where you would find my daily on Sundays. Uh, Keith Schneider and Don Goodman do an outlook. This also talks a lot about the risk factors and really goes back and analyzes the week of the market and what to expect. If you want to email me, you can email me at Mission Market Gauge. You can find me everywhere, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. We actually have a human being who answers the phone, uh, Mary, if you call the toll-free number or you go to the live chat. Um, and we have a consultant, Rob Quinn. Uh, he is extremely valuable to us because you can schedule a call with him, absolutely no obligation, or call him directly, and he will talk to you about everything that we do.
So if you wanted to work with us, just understand what we do. We have subscriptions to the models or to different uh, other strategies as well. But in this case, the dynamic algo strategies, the blended models, um, we do auto trading, uh, which basically we now have a system uh, that we're using that will actually auto trade for you, like a, a TAM, so to speak. We do direct asset management. And again, there's Rob's number. And here's now what I've been very excited to show you. So we've never, ever, ever done this before. You are, and you won't find this opportunity anywhere, not even on our website. But these are our most popular six models. And between them, they will cover everything you might need from individual stocks, sectors and global asset classes with ETFs, the markets trend with the SPY and options if you like, the crypto markets with systems that trade the coins, the crypto related stocks in the Bitcoin ETF. Um, we think it's best for you to work up to being diversified in two or more of these, but everyone has their own preferences. And every model has an introductory one-year price and special discounts for locking in a VIP discount on lifetime memberships. So right now, if you want to schedule a free consultation with Rob Quinn, you will get two weeks of free access to the member areas of any of the systems that I just talked about. So the NASDAQ All-Stars, the large caps, the small and mid caps earnings, the ETF sector plus GEMS, that's a global macro asset. Our one that I didn't talk about today, which is Profit Navigator, which just trades SPY and SPY options. The crypto one I told you about, which is the quant, stocks, ETFs, and cryptocurrencies. Plus, remember that big view and the five uh, ratios I showed you on risk on, risk off? We'll give you 30 days of access to big view premium. So you can go to www.marketgauge.com forward slash call and speak to Rob and he'll talk to you and he'll let you know what's the best way for you to use your, your two weeks of free access to our member area and see what we're doing. And this is a good time to do it because we're still in the beginning of the month. Some rotate at the beginning, some rotate in the middle, some rotate just uh, more fluidly depending on the TSI ranking. Uh, and so in that peak area, you will see that if uh, you want to go on, he'll give you a, a price structure on that. But nonetheless, at least it gives you a nice free way to really get a uh, look at it, take advantage of it. And then of course, like I said, 30 days to be part of our big view premium where you yourself could look at these ratios every single day and including what I showed you before on how the market timing with the SPY has helped downturns and you being in them and getting caught. So uh, that's kind of, uh, that's I think, enough to show you here in one session. Um, are there any particular questions? I would be happy to answer them for you. Uh, we still have a few minutes here left. Um, well, this is the reason why I didn't mention the price, Bob, is because this is a free access to the member area. If you talk to Rob and you want something more than that, he will tell you, but roughly we're saying 197 to get started. If you want to be in the crypto quick start, which would be 997 annually, this is special VIP discounts for lifetime membership as well. So he, um, I didn't want to spend too much time on price. If you call Rob uh, and schedule a call or use the number that I showed you before, um, then he can really talk to you about all of that. But this here is really meant to be a, a way for you to see us for free without any financial obligation whatsoever. Any other questions? You can ask me anything. I mean, I talked to you very specifically about this today, but clearly I have many thoughts on the market. I'd be happy to answer if anybody had any specific questions on that. Okay, well, that's good. I, I always wonder if there are no questions because people were satisfied with what they heard. Uh, so overwhelmed, they're trying to completely digest it all. Um, oh, okay, well, here, here's one. Um, I like that you are blending with systems, good. Um, my preferred instruments for trading, uh, as a discretionary trader, I, I really do it all. I don't do much in the way of futures because of ETFs. And you will see when you take a look at our ETF sector, it covers a lot of the futures in ETFs like GDX, for example, gold miners, um, or GLD if you're looking at gold or SLV for silver. So I really like ETFs 
and sectors, but I also will not shy away from individual stocks. And by the way, I have done extremely well in the last six months following our crypto models, uh, not only uh, for my own personal wallet, uh, obviously, but you know, obviously looking at what the fund is doing as well. Do I miss floor trading? <laughs> what a great question. I do. I do. I mean, that the, they. The, I was raised there. I went down there as a very young girl. And I spent 14 years growing up amongst really having the finger on the pulse of what was going on in the world. And of course, it had a very exciting time. Um, yeah, I miss the noise. I miss the excitement. I miss the camaraderie. Um, I miss the fact that, you know, really, you don't even care what's going on in the news. It's, it's the, actually the ultimate place to follow momentum because when things start moving, you jump in, you follow the momentum. As soon as you hear it dying down, you get out and you scalp and it's, yeah, I miss it. But I also uh, am not as young as I used to be, so I'm not quite so sure I would want to go back to the floor at this point. I've spent so many decades becoming a, a, a really good trader up here that I'm very happy uh, in this world right now. Uh, are you bullish or bearish on the market for the next month? Well, that's another really good question, and I'm so glad people are asking me this. If you ask the quant models right now, what's so interesting is that um, we did a little bit of rotation, as I t mentioned to you in the in NASDAQ All-Stars, with getting into CrowdStrike, which turned out to be great. We've taken a lot of profits in a lot of our tech, but what's really interesting to me right now is that we... Um, went to cash or at least half cash in a lot of the index-based quants, and we bought long bonds, TLTs. So that could be a reason to get a little bit suspicious of how the market is going to do over the next month. So the way I would answer that right now is if we cannot continue to see good rotation into the Russells, the retail, the transportation, in particular those three, and the TLTs start to catch a bid here, I would think we're going risk off and we could see a pretty decent correction, something we haven't had. In the longer term though, I think that we have to keep an eye on inflation. I'm really still very concerned about it. Any cut by the Fed, and now they're talking about potentially in June, I think will just flare up inflation. I don't think it's any great surprise that we're starting to see silver move up, oil move up. That could certainly put a, a, a little bit of a kibosh on the certainly the indices and a lot of the stocks. I'm looking at that happening, let's say, starting in, I said, late spring has been my prediction. But longer term, in 2025, 2026, I think there's some real reasons to think that we might see uh, major growth in the U.S. economy, and that would come from a couple of areas, not the least of which would be reshoring, which is something we're starting to do more and more of. So it's kind of like short term, I'm more neutral, midterm, I have my eye on, like like I said, the commodities and the TLT, which could mean a little bit negative. But in the long, long term, if we get any kind of great correction, I would think that might be a really good buy opportunity. Um, hope that answers that question for you. Do I trust this move on gold? Absolutely. I'm an old gold trader. And one thing I know about commodities, I, and, and, and so two things I'll say about gold. Number one is, up until this point, we've seen weakness being bought and strength being sold. And I said two things, if strength starts being bought, then you know we were going parabolic. And two is if we got through 2100, could be a good reason to think parabolic. So there you go. Right now we should hold that 2080, 2100 level. I think we're going to 2400. I even think that if things get really unraveled, if we go into that late spring, early summer, like I mentioned, inflation spike, kind of like what we did in the late 70s, we could actually see gold at 3000. Um, my concern, Ray, reshorting is that this will drive up inflation as local costs are high. My, my concern, Ray, reshoring, ah, reshoring, I read that wrong, is that this will drive up inflation as local costs are higher than, yes, it could have that initial, uh, yes, definitely. I mean, the whole economic growth, any real growth, our growth has really been stemmed from 
very little in terms of real growth. We're starting to put things in place infrastructure-wise, which of course has been inflationary because of government spending. At some point, we would want to see that normalized, but I wouldn't disagree that the initial um, result could be somewhat inflationary. Um, okay. Um, all right. What pit was I in? <laughs> wow, so people are interested in the floor. I started out in coffee, sugar, cocoa. I worked for Conti Commodities, um, and I was a broker there, probably one of two women in that pit, which was kind of fun. Um, and then Conti Commodities went belly up because of the Hunt Brothers and the silver debacle. I lost my job. So I went over to Comex and um, there I did not become a broker, but I worked for a couple of brokers and did charting and stuff. And so that was a lot of fun. And then eventually became a broker in NYMEX where I spent most of my time trading crude oil. So I traded crude oil for about six years in that pit, then went to Finex and then uh, eventually left the floor. But I traded everything. Um, this was just really more my experience in terms of floor trading. And everything I've learned about trading, really, I learned from those days uh, because it was just an amazing experience all around. Is Kane looking attractive? Oh, my God. Somebody knows me, right? Oh, Vinny. Okay. <laughs> if it's the same Vinny I'm thinking of. So, you know, I have, and I'm going to see how much time I have because, uh, yeah, I have a couple more minutes. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I really hope you all call Rob, by the way, or and, and schedule a call and find out how you can take a look at this, because I think this is really, to me, the most exciting uh, way. Do I still discretionary trade? I do. I do it for the asset management company. I no longer do it for a service. And I just want to mention that part of the reason is because I didn't have to kill myself anymore because of how well these quants are doing. But in my discretionary trading, I like to find things that might be more predictive, like buying silver, buying gold, buying gold miners, uh, buying oil. These are things that the quants are not in, but we're in. So I just want to make sure you understand that. Now I can answer your question about sugar. There are three things that you need to watch to really see if inflation is going to pick up. You don't have to listen to anybody. You don't even have to listen to me. Just learn to watch three things. Number one is even though silver has moved up, it's still so underperforming gold if it starts to outperform. And we're still far from there. But if it does, inflationary. Number two is the dollar. The dollar has been trading basically in a range between 103 and 104. If you look at the dollar yen today, you can see that the yen actually started to pick up some traction. And if the dollar breaks 103, looking at DXY, with all the talk of BRICS and gold standards and everything else that are happening in different countries, even in general, with the dollar's decrease of purchase power over the years versus inflation, that could be another inflationary indicator if it drops more precipitously. And the third, now to answer your question, Vinny, is sugar. Uh, I have been a big proponent of watching sugar. It started out in 2019, 2020 at five cents a pound. It went to 28 cents a pound in 2023. It's currently trading at around 21.50. So it's still four times more than it was in 2020. So it's still inflationary. There's still shortages around, even with increased production in Brazil, which is why we've had the most recent correction. And it's very weather related. It's very social related because people will go to sugar during hard times. People will buy junkier food during hard times, even though the cost goes up. Uh, it's a comfort food type of situation. It's been my secret barometer. And it also moved big in the 70s. So if it gets back up, 24 cents is what I'm looking at. Above there, especially with the other factors, forget like what I said, what anybody says, you know we're going into a second wave of inflation and you should trade accordingly. I think that's probably it. Maybe I have time for one more quick question. Um, okay, well, if not, I just want to say in the time that I have left, Thank you again to David and Anka. Uh, thank you to all the women who are also going to be presenting. I know so many of them, and, and they're all amazing. Um, and it's just a wonderful month for women to be recognized. I always appreciate that. But even for all the men who have been here, uh, thank you, because obviously you're smart enough to know listening to women is not such a bad thing when it comes to trading. We tend to be really good and very, very risk adverse. So again, thank you all. Uh, call Rob and come look for me all over the, the, the internet. Okay.